All right, next up, I'd like to welcome Guy Dupont. Guy is a software developer, hardware designer, and on days where he's feeling brave, he'll refer to himself as an artist. His work encourages users to give a second look to the tech we collectively s dismiss as useless and obsolete. I'll help you out here. There you go. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Guy, but for this weekend only, uh, to appease the locals, I'll respond to Guy. I apologize for both pronouncing and writing my own name wrong. That's supposed to be a capital P, apparently. Something terrible happened at the border a few generations ago. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm a software developer, according to my LinkedIn profile, but if you've had the misfortune of encountering any of my work on other social media sites, you'll know that hardware has a, a very special place in my heart. So I'd like to share a few pieces of work that I've done just so you can get a sense of who you're dealing with. Um, these are not gifts, but we'll get to the gifts. Uh, so this is a, a T9 macro pad, and it's, it's not actually a macro pad. It's a full keyboard that has T9 predictive text baked into the firmware. And so you can plug this into any computer or phone um, and type like you're texting somebody in the late 90s. This is, this is a combination uh, scanner and printer that you could theoretically bring to a restaurant and turn a QR code menu into a physical paper copy right at your table. Yeah. Oh, we hate QR codes in this crowd. All right. Bummer. Um, yeah, I got kicked out of two restaurants testing this out. Uh, this is a mechanical color picker. So those are rotary dip switches on the left, and you can dial in a hex color. Um, the LED will roughly display that color, and when you smash the button, it sends the color into whatever software you have open on your computer. And, and finally, I made, a, I made a typeface that renders your text as if it were serial data on an oscilloscope. <laughs> Fully open source. Yeah, you do what you want with that. Um, so that's a little bit about me and, and my work, but I want to talk about somebody else really quick. This is John. That's my father-in-law. Um, you can see he's a, he's a happy man, and, I, and I'd like to show you why he's so happy in this photo. So first off, he is rocking some handmade knitwear from his wife, Leslie. He is about to drink some coffee, I assume, out of a beautiful ceramic mug handmade by his daughter, my wife, Hannah, and he is absolutely clinging to that piece of art by my daughter, his granddaughter, Rory. That's either a bunny rabbit or a dump truck. We'll, f we'll figure it out uh, in a couple of years. Um, so I've been doing gift exchanges and holidays with this family for a long time now, uh, and, and I'm always so struck by just like the sheer joy uh, when one of these handmade items uh, is, is transferred as a gift. Um, and a few years ago, I decided I wanted in on that action. You know, but wh what do I make? Like, what what was I gonna do? I, I'm a software developer. I make apps. Am I gonna give someone an app for Christmas? Turns out, yeah, uh, that's exactly what I'm gonna do. So it started out as software. It started out as little interactive like web pages that um, I would give as cards. As I got more into hardware, my gifts went that way too. So now I'm gonna share a few more things I made, and these are all gifts that I made specifically for other people. Um, this is the Charlie card uh, I made for a friend who he and his wife just welcomed a uh, baby, and they also have a young and energetic golden retriever. So my gift was, uh, hey, I'll walk your dog while you're taking care of your baby. So this is a fridge magnet, and they can hit the button, and I will get a push notification on my phone, um, the lights indicating the status, and as soon as I acknowledge the push notification, the received light will start blinking, indicating that I can come over and, and give the dog a walk. Um, this is this was for another close friend who I go to the the Bonnaroo Music Festival with every year, um, and in 2020 when when you know what happened, uh, I I made this it's a modified clock radio where you can dial in the day and time as well as the stage. So there are artists playing across multiple stages, and when you hit play, the clock radio plays mu plays the music from the artist that was playing at that stage at that time. So it's a time capsule, and, and we did the 2019 version of the festival because that was the previous year. Uh, and this is a collaboration I did with my wife. Uh, it's a ceramic Bluetooth speaker, so she made the exterior, I did the internals, and if you flip it over, it's got one of those big surface transducers on the bottom, so it plays music through whatever surface you have it sitting on. Um, so ho hopefully I've, I've piqued your interest at least a little bit why you should, why you should make 
gifts for people, but I feel obligated to, to explain further why I think it's a, a good idea. So for, <laughs> we're gonna start with a hand wavy one. It feels good, turns out, don't overthink it. I tried to like over science this slide, but as I said, no, this is a beautiful, thoughtful, uh, caring crowd, great friends and family members. They already know that it feels really good and it's fun to give and receive a good gift, a thoughtful gift, right? Uh, but some more, some more meaty reasons here. So uh, how many people here have made something for themselves that they use daily, semi-regularly, that just makes some aspect of your life a little bit easier? All right, good enough. <laughs> just kidding, that's awesome. Um, so it turns out uh, the normies in our lives have those problems too. And I, I'm talking specifically about problems that are not necessarily common or, quote, important enough to, to have some company out there mass market uh, a product to fix. But we as makers are like uniquely qualified to look at those around us and identify those little annoyances um, and, and address them if it's appropriate. And, and I think it's never been easier uh, as, as hardware devs, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, you know, we've been, we've been kind of capitalism, I'll speak for myself a little bit, into thinking that everything we make needs to have some broad audience and we're constantly trying to like, how does this scale? How do we manufacture this? Um, free yourself of that. It's fun. It's fun. And, and it's r particularly fun when you pick uh, a person in your life who, who you can actually help out. Unless they don't want their problems solved with technology, don't, do, don't give them those tech gifts. Uh, like I was saying, it's more accessible than ever. We've got free and open source uh, development design tools, we've got high-level programming languages, so the barrier to entry for writing firmware is as low as ever. Uh, you can get all the stuff you need to make projects um, in like single quantities for a reasonable cost, and if you don't believe me, go to this event's sponsor page and just start clicking around. You'll find everything you need. Um, and we've got these crazy powerful little microcontrollers for a couple bucks each. You can connect to the internet, you can render HDMI video, like th there's so much power available uh, for not much cost. Um, and then this one I felt was important. Um, I want to talk about open source, like this is the open hardware summit, right? So um, you might think to yourself, if I'm designing a gift for someone, a specific problem for a specific person, it's probably not the first thing on your list to open source, because you know, who's, it, who's it for? Um, but what I have found is if you are making something specific, and y you put it out there and you make it searchable, there's somebody out there who, who has a thing they want to build, but hasn't yet gotten access to this like knowledge and skill graph. And that gap is hard to cross sometimes. So if you make something, and I use DIY bat signal as an example because that's something I actually did make for someone. Um, you're creating a node at the very exterior of this knowledge graph. Like if it's weird enough, like way out there, um, but those are so important. Those are entry points for, for new people who, who want to get into this. Um, that's what you search, right? When you, you want to make something, but you don't know how it's made, you search for the thing, not the stuff you don't know about yet. Um, so I think it's really important, even if you're making it for specific people, uh, to open source uh, your work. Um, okay, I'm going to talk about a little bit about what I think makes gifts good. This is a not so scientific list. This is anecdotal from me. Uh, I did do a little bit of research to make sure I wasn't like talking out my bum. But um, so in my opinion, good gifts are used, and I do not mean pre-owned, although pre-owned gifts are rad too. Uh, what I mean by used is that the gift has a place in the, the recipient's life over time. Um, unique, personal, and handmade, I don't need to tell you what those are, I frankly, I think those are all kind of bonus. I always appreciate them, but they're not as critical. Um, and then autonomous is a big one. So what I mean by autonomous is the gift does not demand any labor from the recipient uh, after they've given it or from you as the giver. Like you don't want to be on the hook for like maintaining a, a gift over time. So this one is so, this one to me is so important and it's an easy one to get wrong when you're, you know, we all know doing hardware and software is hard. So um, you gotta keep an eye on that. Uh, and, I, and an example of a, of a failure of this was I was once gifted a full-size canoe with nowhere to put it and no way to move it. And I lived uh, in a 700 square foot apartment with another dude at the time. So um, great gift, very useful, low autonomy. Don't, don't do that. 
Um, so a little bit of research that I did found really interesting though was like when people go to give gifts, they, they overthink about the moment they transfer the gift, like they hand it over, and they tend to pick things that like maybe aren't ideal for the person because they like over index on that like wow moment. Um, so it turns out people like the, the fact that I'm saying a good gift is, is used is actually backed by research. Recipients of gifts prefer things that they can keep around um, in, in their lives. Okay, so I'd like to everyone to put their bright designer hats uh, on for a second. We're going to talk about a, a product design uh, framework here called the concept of use. So there are three U's. Uh, we already talked about used, but uh, I want to talk about useful and usable. Useful m means the, the product is um, accomplishes something for the user, and I'm going to keep it hand-wavy. Accomplishes doesn't have to be a practical thing. It could just be it sparks joy when they look at it. Um, and usable is how well that thing lends itself to being useful and thus used. Um, and so to simplify that, it's like how easy is it to use? How intuitive is it? Is it fragile? Does it need a ton of instruction? Um, those are, those, that's usability. And usability is the first thing to go out the window when budget constraints come up, time constraints come up. And uh, frankly, I, you know, as a hardware person, I know not all of us like to put our designer hat on. No, not like us, not many of us, not all of us, uh, like the word product uh, to begin with. So I think a lot of usability stuff kind of gets dismissed as bonus when really um, it shouldn't be. And I just want to say, if you're giving a gift, I think I think you owe the recipient as much uh, usability as you can possibly muster because they're not investing their own money into this thing and they may not have even explicitly asked for it. So if you give them something that isn't usable, it might not get used and that's I think the ultimate goal. So do not, do not dismiss usability, focus on it at every step uh, while you're coming up with your gifts. Um, and so I, I was just talking about it as if it's a product, right? Your gifts are products, but due to the constraints, like you're probably working by yourself, you don't have much time or money or access to fancy processes. Um, it, it often could feel like you're building a prototype. And so you have to live kind of in both camps. Um, so uh, maintenance is a big thing. So you want to design for zero maintenance. Like I was saying, no labor after it's, after it's uh, transferred. But it, it's a paradox. You're going to have to fix it. Like we've all made things. We've all, you know, it's, it rarely comes out right the first time. And so you have to design for no maintenance, but accept that you'll have to do it. And so I want to give some tips for maintenance. Um, so ideally, you don't have to debug in person. Uh, I don't know how far your recipient lives away from you, but ideally you don't have to actually be there with the gift to figure out when something goes wrong. Um, so I recommend simple and discrete error reporting. Get, get information back to you uh, via the recipient or via the internet, whatever. I always like to do, I take a, um, an RGB LED, I hide it somewhere in the gift. I do not turn it on unless something goes wrong. And what I do is I blink a specific color and pattern uh, for particular issues. And I'll, I'll just, if, if it's not working, I'll just ask, hey, can you check the, can you flip it over and see if something's blinking? And that way, you're most of the way there to figuring out what's wrong uh, for very low cost. Um, talking to third party services, this is really interesting as our gifts go online. Um, I've seen so many cool projects with like, with uh, LLMs, like asking ChatGPT to generate a story for the device or a poem, and you get this like, refreshing content and it's really it's really cool but as soon as they change their API or as soon as the key expires they, they hike the prices um, if, you, if your device is talking directly to their service what are you gonna, what are you gonna do it's gonna it's gonna have to go offline so I always make sure that the code running on the the actual gift is only talking to co other code that I wrote and I control. So I often will build a little proxy server that I run either on a machine that I own or in the cloud. This is most relevant for, for you know, IoT stuff, but um, definitely, definitely, definitely create like a seam for yourself where you have full control. Uh, <laughs> this is a bit of a joke, uh, but what I mean by this is don't make a gift that requires security of any kind. Don't take your family's sensitive data into your hands. Don't do it, just don't. It's a bad idea. Unless you're, an, if you're an expert, if you do this for a living, you go for it, but uh, don't. Um, okay, and you should think about, when you're, when you're thinking of a gift to give, how your uh, 
your object is going to be interacted with. And the big takeaway from these slides, I want to be lean on paradigms that your user already knows. And that's the, the unique thing about doing GIFs is you know your user. You have that part figured out. Um, and so you can design it specifically for them. This stuff is all, you know, I, I place this relatively, it's going to be different for everyone, but I want to draw specific attention to the danger zone over here, where, where it's things that are really easy for us. You know, we know, we know how to, you know, create jumpers, adding test points to make things really configurable uh, as safety, safety mechanisms. But I don't want to teach someone binary just to change the color of their LED, you know? And, and sc even screw terminals, like not everyone has a screwdriver. Um, and, and you don't want to leave it up to them to figure out where the wire goes, and people don't want to do that either. Um, so I am biased as a software person. I, I'm sure I've made that clear already. But I think software is a really, is, a, is your friend uh, in these situations because on average, folks are more comfortable using software. Like people have smartphones, people use email and stuff for work. People, people use software more than, more than bespoke hardware, I would say. So um, something I, I like to do is to make a web UI to control your hardware. And, and with tools like CircuitPython, you can plug your device into a computer. It'll show up as a flash drive. And you can th the user can just open a, a web page. And you can completely drive your, your hardware from that web page. Um, and like it's cool because you can you can add all these you can add new features to it you can add all sorts of UI and like turns out software UI doesn't cost anything except frustration um, <laughs> you know you can change it you can put a color picker in there you can add all this stuff um, and and I, I'm willing to bet that your your recipient will will be more comfortable dealing with that than maybe fiddly hardware stuff um, another thing I always do I love this is if you do a CSV which is a very simple spreadsheet. Um, that's how I do Wi-Fi credentials for things that go online, is I just make a little spreadsheet, I put two cells, SSID and password, um, and then like people generally know how to use spreadsheets, and they can open that in whatever software they are comfortable using, fill in the cells, and as soon as they hit save, the device reboots and connects to the internet. So it's, you get the best of both worlds. You, you use what they're comfortable with, and you get, um, you get access to their data really easily. Um, yeah, so this is actually the first version of that color picker I was showing you earlier, and I had it hanging on a Christmas tree, and it was changing the color of the lights on the tree. Um, and it turns out nobody wanted to touch it because it looked really scary, and I wasn't scared of it, but everyone else was scared of it because it turns out most folks don't know what's going through those wires. They don't know if they're going to shock themselves. They don't know if they're going to break something off. So my point here is, is um, back to the usability thing. It, it, Make sure your, your thing doesn't look fragile and doesn't feel fragile. Do your best to tuck things away, um, keep things nice and tidy, even if it's not your, your nature, because um, it'll get used a lot, a lot more. Um, I have a bunch of tools. I'm going to mostly leave, leave a list at the end um, for software ones, but I, I just want to emphasize how cool PCBs are. I don't know, I'm preaching to the choir here. Look at, look at your chest right now. You've got the badge. Um, I joke PCB stands for Project Completely Built because you get electrical, obviously that's what they're made for, you get your circuitry, but you also get um, visual design and guides for free, you know, screen printing, and now you get them in uh, full color. This is Arturo's business card if he's here. Um, I've never wanted to do business so bad in my life. This thing looks awesome. <laughs> um, so yeah, you get, you get that basically for free. You, you can build full enclosures out of PCBs, and just in general, they are sturdy, they're real cheap, um, and they're precisely cut, and, and you just make one order, and, and you kind of get everything you need. So these are some examples. Carl's Rover, uh, that's actually one PCB that gets folded into a car, and all of the electronics are inside it. Pocket operators, these, these are what have inspired, and I think set the precedent for products that are just basically PCBs with stuff on them. Um, like normal people use those, like the awesome. Uh, and then the Chompy synth came out recently. That's a great example of just, they built the enclosure out of just gorgeous uh, PCBs. So um, also apparently headphone drivers, PCBs, go for it. Um, so yeah, I love them. And don't be scared. Don't be scared to learn how to make them. Um, they're like, there's a great, watch uh, Sean Himmel has a DigiKey guide. I watched that in a morning 
and I ordered PCBs, the macro pad PCBs that evening. That was my first PCB ever, and I've sold like 200 of those. Um, you can do it. If I can do it, you can do it. Don't be, don't be uh, put off. Yeah, these are just other tools that I like. Each one kind of touches on something that I said earlier. Um, I'll leave this up for a sec. And I, I do have links uh, at the end, too, where you can click and, and find all this stuff. Uh, big, I'm, I'm a huge Circuit Python advocate. I highly recommend it. Every gift I've given, everything I showed here, except for this speaker, is run, running Circuit Python. We good? All right. So you can find more about me. That QR code is so big. Yeah. Thank you so much.